Hey everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm always excited to meet people who travel, get outside, um, you know, are interested in being healthy and getting outside, two of my biggest passions. So I'm excited to chat with Megan today. Hi, Megan. Hello, thank you so much for having me on, April. Yeah, so I know we connected about solo hiking and solo backpacking, so mm -hmm. that's not something I've done much of, to be honest. It kind of is a little intimidating to go out solo you know, I'll do some walking, but hiking and backpacking, not so much. So how did you get started? Tell me about your first experience. Yeah. So my first experience, actually, I solo traveled before I really did a ton of solo hiking and backpacking. So I'll start there. Yeah. And a lot of it comes down to if anyone's familiar with Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram seven. So like anyone who knows Enneagram, that's going to be like a okay, we kind of get it moment. Um, they're the, called the enthusiast. We always are looking for the next adventure, something that's going to bring us joy. And that's very much me. And when I got to college, so I had a background, I guess back up a little bit. Growing up, I went to a summer camp where we did group hikes. We would go on overnight backpacking trips in the Appalachians. And so that's kind of what got me intrigued by that. And then when I got to college and I had some more freedom and I could like plan and do things, I would ask people and I kind of got tired, honestly, of not being able to have solid plans and other people bailing last minute. So I just kind of said, screw it. I'm going to go on my own. And that first started with travel. Um, I did a study abroad May Mester to Poland. Oh, nice. And that was with my class. So I absolutely like that was really cool. The class was actually so I went to University of South Carolina and the honors college there gives a lot of flexibility as long as you're taking an honors history based course on what you need for like your with honors recommend like recs, right. or recs. Um, and so I took a class that was really all it was a discussion based class on the sociology of the Holocaust. Wow. And so we went to it was really neat. So that was spring semester and then May semester we all traveled to Poland. Um, and so I kind of got bit by the travel bug like and so I immediately looked for the next year to study abroad in the spring but at that point I made the realization that if I was with a group of students that I kind of knew like we kind of stayed together I didn't really like I got to explore Poland but I didn't get to explore the culture I didn't really meet many locals because you're kind of in this group okay and, and you're, stay, you're staying then kind of with each other yeah. you're not like staying with Polish or you know local families then so much no and there are ways like if anyone studied abroad there are ways to kind of do that and like but if so anyways I, I purposely sought out a program that was not affiliated with my school simply because like I knew I would kind of meet a few other Americans that were going through the same program but I was like no like I want something that's going to be yeah. more immersive it forces me to get outside of my comfort zone some of that's just my personality of like no let's try something new like this seems more interesting yeah and so while I was there What's interesting is for Easter, our Easter break, which is basically spring break, they just call it Easter break. Right. We had three weeks off because you have school, 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 and then this three week break, and then it goes wow. into finals. And finals are like I had three or four classes, but the finals were going to be over this like month long period. So I was like, cool, I can travel for that yeah. months. And then my finals, like I'm not at the front end of that, so I can still get back and study. Trying to find people to travel with and actually commit like my saving. So I ended up the first week and a half, I was like, I'm going to have to just go alone if I want to go see Italy or so like, and if anyone's traveled in Europe, like Ryanair, you might have some sketchy like takeoff and <laughs> landings in the plane, but you can get a flight for like $10 at the time. This was 2008. Um, so I think it's like 30 bucks now, but I mean, yeah. still, it's crazy. Still, cheap. Uh, that's crazy. Cheap. So yeah, for exactly. someone on a college budget, I'm like, let me just throw some things in a backpack and go. But I very, all of this to say, like I very quickly realized I either had to just go or probably wasn't going to. If I was waiting on other people, it wasn't going to work. Um, now the second half, the last week, week and a half, I did actually have a travel buddy. One of the other girls was like, here's my budget. I don't care where we go. Oh, have nice. fun planning. And I was like, this is perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, she actually, funny enough, we were like, on opposite ends of the country before she actually lives like 20 minutes from me now really um, oh my gosh what yeah, a, really what's cool. a full circle thing though. yeah <laughs> it's, it's nuts um but yeah and then on that trip I got really comfortable with I mean this was 2008 so like yes I had the internet but I was still like printing out MapQuest stuff 
Yeah. Like I didn't have GPS to get around. So I was still having to like wander around a city that I didn't know and figure it out and talk to random strangers. And I got really good at reading hostel reviews and knowing which ones were safe. Um, yeah, that, that is important. That's it is, it's very important. <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard, I'm sure we've all heard some horror stories and I purposely didn't watch the horror films revolve around it. <laughs> yeah, right. I felt like that was a terrible idea. Um, so that's how I got into solo travel. And I think that set me up beautifully to be totally fine. Like during that, to explore a city, to like go on the occasional hike, like I had to get okay with solo hiking and solo just exploring. Right. Um, and then it wasn't until PT school. So I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I graduated with my mathematics degree, full pivoted into physical therapy, moved out to Arizona, um, where I also, again, knew no one. Um, and I started taking my weekends where I would find a new area of the city, get far enough away from where I live. So that it was like, well, now I have to study for hours to make it worth it. But then I finish off the day with a hike. And so I got more and more into solo hiking. And then after I, was it after I graduated sometime around my last year, um, I decided I wanted to go camping and kind of ran into the same thing where one, I was like having to wait on other people and then they'd bail yeah. Um, there was this thought. one like spot that I really wanted to check out and I was like, you know what? I could just use some time to myself. So I went to an area that I relatively knew that I knew there was going to be enough people around. So if something went South, like I could right. get help. Right. That's um, hard. and then the other big tip that I tell people for solo camping, like if it seems nerve wracking to you, start with car camping. Mm. I, I agree. That's yeah, because you don't have to. I eventually got into solo backpacking, but like I, there was only so much planning. And when I started hearing noises at night and yeah. freaked out, like I just rolled down the seats in my car and slept in there and locked the doors. Like you just naturally feel a little bit safer <laughs> there versus in a tent. Yeah. Um. So now I now I can do it in a tent, but in, admittedly, that first time I one hundred percent bailed into my car. <laughs> and I think that's a great. Um, then, yeah place to tell people to start too because we all have those nerves and you go to lay down and you know then it's the little noise oh the and, wind like yeah. <laughs> and you think it's a bear outside I just um so yeah I think my to my two biggest recommendations for people that want to try solo camping is like start with car camping so you can bail into the vehicle and then have a white noise machine like whether it's on your phone or whatever so that you don't hyper focus on noises outside right yeah and I think when you were starting as a, a youngster too, you probably got some skills in hiking the Appalachians too, of like, you know, things, you know, making sure you stay hydrated and some of those other things that people should think about. Yeah, I think growing up as an athlete in South Carolina, I mean, that was pretty drilled into me and I have physician parents, so it was extra drilled into me. Um, so little things of like staying hydrated, making sure your shoes have good traction, making sure your gear fits properly so you're not like chafing your... Like I remember back in the, when I was a kid, they didn't really like the backpacks all had the external frames. Oh yeah. Yeah. But like the metal frame and then the backpack was kind of attached to it. I mean, those things weren't comfortable at all. The like, backpacks now are so much nicer. They're ventilated. Um, but yeah, having gear that fits properly, um, being hydrated, having enough food on hand, having a water filter on hand because you can't just trust a stream. Like all those things are skills that I didn't even realize I was gaining as a kid. Right, right. And I know there's places for people to now to like, you know, some of the REI stores and local places that you can go and maybe, you know, get some of those. And of course, YouTube. I love YouTube for learning yeah. anything, you know, just. YouTube's great for it. And somewhere, I actually made a post way back in the day at some point, but REI will do this too, where they show you how to adjust your pack to carry the weight a little bit better. And I will say almost all of my gear is from REI because they have their year long, like no questions asked return policy. So you can, if you go and you try on a backpack and like they have the things to like weigh it down so you can walk around the store. But if you then go on, like there's no substituting for like a 12 mile hike to know how it's going to fit you. And if you go and do a couple different hikes and you're like, Ooh, this doesn't actually fit. Like you can return it to REI. Wow. Most companies don't let you do that, but REI will. And so I've actually, I've taken advantage of that more than once with like a trail pack that happened to like, there was a fault in the seam and it failed on me like the first trail run or a pack that felt great in store. But then I went, I said 12 miles actually, because it was a 12 mile Canyon hike that I was like, Hmm, this might not be the best idea for me. I maybe need to get a different one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So are there things that you um, do to um, ensure your safety? I know you've mentioned a couple of them. Yeah, so travel or backpacking or both? Because those are oh, different, either one. different lists. Okay, <laughs> so some of this, so with tr actually with both, a lot of research goes into it um, because I want to make sure that I know I have an escape route if something goes south. Um, and there is, I, I do want to start off by saying there's a certain level of privilege to some of the tools that do ensure safety, like a Garmin inReach. If you are going to solo hike or solo backpack, that is a game changer. However, it is hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Um, so recognize now, definitely look at like secondhand stores. I know REI even has secondhand options now. There's a lot of different things. And I'll shout out, there's a group that I'm a part of called Send Fem. Oh, nice. Um, I'll shoot you the link. Yes, please. So, so we can, can put it in so the notes. Any yeah. female or female identifying, like it says femme, like trans females, anyone like that is welcome to join and it's free to join. There are like tiers where you can get extra information for paid, but that's a really great group that has a ton of resources on how to get into camping, hiking, backpacking, mountaineering, ice climbing. Like I just tried ice climbing for this first time with this group. Oh, wow. Um, nice. So anyways, that is a phenomenal resource. And then they have there's an entire section on secondhand gear or gear recommendations within that group. So that's actually how I have, like, I keep an eye out on that group for a Garmin in reach. Cause actually I don't have one yet. So I think that's a beautiful tool, but I admittedly do not have one um, because the price tag has held me off yeah, for a while. Right. Um, so other tools for backpacking, really a lot of them. So, most of the time when I've overnight backpacked by myself, it's either been in a national forest or a national park or something of that nature. And so I can do a couple things. One, I can share my GPS with oh, someone on my phone. Um, it's not quite, it doesn't work quite as well as like in a Garmin inReach, but it works pretty darn well. So if things go south and like, I know I have a friend that's like, Hey, if you don't hear from me in 48 hours, like check and see where I'm at. Um, and then rangers. So like, there's a lot of trail hats do actually have like a sign in or a way for you to notify, like, Hey, I'm on this trail and sign out. And a lot of people don't take advantage of that. Oh, nice. That's actually really smart. I think mm -hmm. I see it on a ton of trails and I almost like most people just breeze right by it. Um, and, and I get it. Like I get that you don't expect anything to happen. Um, but it really is a great idea to, let people know what trail you're on, like have someone trusted who knows what trail you're on, what time you're supposed to start, what time you're coming back. And then any contingency plans, like if I'm like, hey, I might go for two days, I might go for three, letting people know most places these days are permitted. So you kind of do have to like, you know what nights you're going. Right. Um, but yeah, letting someone know your plan, signing in if there's a way to at a ranger station so that they know. Um, and then having the proper equipment. So particularly for backpacking, if you were in bear country, take a bear canister. Do not have any food out. Um, and that includes nothing that smells Yeah, is actually the rule. And a lot of people don't realize that. So in your bear canister, like it's not just food. If you're using toothpaste, if you're using soap, if you have chapstick, like that needs to go in the bear canister overnight. Do not have it in your tent. Um, most national parks will have policies in place and things set up. And yeah, but do your research on the equipment and then do your research on the trails. Is it populated? Is it not so populated? And those are the ones where I actually, I want those more. I would rather not run into people, but at the same time, I go extra links to make sure that people know where I'm at right? and where I plan on camping so that if things go south, they kind of know my path. You can also, Strava is an app that I think it's free still. What's it called? Um, Strava, S-T-R-A-V-A. Okay. It's utilized a lot by trail runners to, nice. and the, the one downside is it's normally public, meaning anyone can see where you're at. Okay. However, there's probably something in the settings actually to limit that. I've never really truly looked, but I do think it is public. And but of the ways that I think someone is going to like stalk and find you and do like I just I would almost rather have that for the people who do know me, who can come find me if things go south, if something happens. Right. Because I'm, yeah, like I'm not, I'm less worried about someone using that as a way to track and find me. Right, right. So that's for backpacking. 
Um, and then making sure you have like, have the bear spray on hand. Oh, if you have a bear canister, have a weight, make sure you can open it. I've done this. So learn from <laughs> my mistakes. I have learned how to open it. And then I went backpacking in Rocky mountain national park and it had a freak hail and snowstorm happen really early in the season. And my hands were so cold that I could not open my food. Oh no. Thankfully I heard another group down the way. And at this point, most people in the backcountry are very reasonable, respectable people. So like, even though it was like three, like gruffy looking dudes that I was walking up, like I didn't have a problem walking up and being like, can someone please open this for me? I don't have anything. Cause I had, I had flown to Rocky national. And so, and I hadn't checked um, a knife in my bag. So oh, generally yeah. like a pocket right. knife or something like that, you can use it to leverage and pry it open. Um, anyone who's used a bear canister knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> they, they can be, it's like trying to open a pill bottle where they have like yes. a child safety stuff. Oh, it's like oh that times 10. Right. So having a leverage of some kind is helpful. Okay. Then actually first, do you have any questions that you want to like dive into for that before I pivot to traveling? Um, not that I can think of, but I think that you're okay. point, pointing out that, you know, letting people know your plan, I think is super important. We hear oftentimes of stories where people, you know, they do take a wrong turn in the woods or, you know, the weather it happens. Changed. Yeah, it it. happens. <laughs> weather happens. I mean, we've been seeing so much crazy weather happening. I think someone mm -hmm. got snow the other day that was unexpected. So I think mm -hmm. it's super important to let people yeah. know. That's another good point, actually. Checking the weather and having gear on hand. Now, that freak snowstorm, it wasn't in the weather. There's no way I would have known to, like, take crampons with me. Like, that, that wasn't, or right. actually, I really only needed um, yeah, crampons, not micro spikes for that one, but making sure that if weather does say something like have the gear with you yeah, to do that, I think that's, it seems so simple, but we don't like, if we're like, oh, I know the weather in that area. Like, no, no, just double check it. And then there's two map apps that will help to like trail maps. So all trails is probably the most well-known one. And then Gaia, G-A-I-A is another one that's a little bit more advanced. It takes like, oh, there's a learning curve to figuring out how to utilize it, but you can plan a route with it and then have it downloaded. So you can like follow and make sure you're on trail that you don't get too off track. And then I believe there's also a way to share that information. Oh, nice. As well. Yeah. Um, but I've utilized that one before for trails that don't like, if it's not on all trails, you can kind of create it on Gaia. Okay. Yeah, that's super smart. Yeah. And then for travel, a lot of it, honestly, so I'll be transparent and I just have this innate ability to read reviews and figure out what's legit and what's not. Um, it, for traveling, for hostels, for food, like for restaurants, like it's just this weird ability. Like I have friends that message me and they're like, hey, I'm going to Toronto this weekend. Can you look up a restaurant? I want this. And like, I can find it for them um, and have it be this amazing experience. So I've got some tools, but I did want to start with like, hey, some of this is just a weird innate ability that yeah. I don't know if I can explain. Right. Um, but like, do again, just do your research. Like, so I'm big. I normally stay at hostels, even still, like I'm mid thirties and I still stay at hostels because I would rather put my money into exploring the city and the culture and doing things versus like, I just need a bed. I don't really yeah. care. Right. right. Um, and most of the hostels now were really nice. Like the last couple of times, the ones I stayed in in South America, you had this like own little cubby. You had a curtain that goes over your door. Oh you had gosh. an individual light and outlet, like crazy nice. Wow. Like you just, yeah. Um, and they're a great place to meet other travelers. Like I am still friends with people all over the world that I've met in random hostels. Oh, I love that. I so, think that's a great plug. And I, and I do agree. Um, when you read about hostels, some have private rooms. Um, they've changed a lot. They're not just. Yeah. So you can do private rooms, but even the dorm rooms, like look at the photos. Some of them, like when I stayed in Iceland, it was still just a bunch of bunk beds thrown into a room. But then there's plenty now where it's, yes, it's a dorm room, but it's like this individual, like what, like sealed in bunk that feels very private. It's yeah. Like a picture would make more sense, which right. yeah. Um, but they're really neat and then they have great communal areas. When you read the reviews, look and see what the engagement is. Look and see. So people these days on hostel, so hostelworld.com is like the main one that I use for researching hostels. And you can read the reviews. Like people will say kind of what personalities are there, yes. how 
loud is it at night? Or do they have like solid quiet hours that they actually enforce? Is there Wi-Fi? Is there a common area where you can meet other people? What's the demographic? Like as a mid thirties, I probably don't want to stay in a hostel these days. Actually, I don't hate when it's a bunch of like teenagers or like young 20 year olds. Um, But at the same time, like you can kind of find what the demographics are in a hostel well ahead of time just by perusing the reviews like do your due diligence there don't just read the first two yes like read a bunch like I probably read an average of 10 reviews per listing that I I look at and then I'm looking for cleanliness community um yeah like if yeah you don't just write it off just because it has 4.5 stars like maybe it has really like five stars and more like a bunch of these areas that you actually care about and then it's just someone being salty is why yes. the rating is yes. like, yeah exactly yeah. and i always tell people too on any review site go and look at the negative reviews click on that 100 percent. i look at the top see... reviews and i look at the negative reviews yes. and then generally there's a couple that are kind of the mid-range yeah that are really give you the full picture so i think that is probably my biggest piece of advice whether you're staying in hostels or hotels literally anywhere um looking up what the transportation looks like so one of the things that i didn't do so ryanair while it's very cheap, tends to fly into really small airports that are like an hour bus right outside of the city. Okay. Um, so you still get there for really cheap, but just know that from a timeline perspective and a planning perspective. And then don't overload your schedule. It's something that I did far too often. And it, it makes you always be worried about making it to your next thing. You never really get to be in the present and really enjoy when you overload your schedule. So have a couple things that's like, hey, these are the big things that I really want to make sure I can do. And then figure out the rest. Like, just go wander the city. Right. Um, and then the other, yeah, another piece of advice would be something. Do something that's more really immersive in the culture at that place. Like, go, if you're in Peru, go take a coffee or a chocolate class. If you're in Vietnam, like, go to the rice fields. Like, do something where you really get... And not the touristy ones. Again, that's yeah. where you do your due diligence on the reviews and make sure that it isn't just like a whitewashed activity. Right. Yeah. 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 I like that a lot. Are there things that you do? Have you ever run into a situation where emotionally or mentally you did get scared? And how do you work through some of those issues? There's so I have definitely been in some situations, particularly in my 20s, um, looking back where I'm like, I maybe should not be alive today. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I've had friends end up in actually pretty bad situations mm-hmm. traveling. Um, and a lot of it was just not being smart, not having a safety net around you, whether it's, um, so I will, I'll use one personal example. So well, this was Jamaica and I actually was even staying only at a resort. This was right after I graduated from college. A friend was getting married there at a resort my understanding I didn't do a ton of research prior to this one because it really was right after graduation and I was like well we're staying at a resort whatever I don't have the means even to like go off and explore on my own like I normally would and the little bit of research that I did do said that's probably unsafe how about we not so but you think you're good inside the resort but the resorts have clubs and I was dancing at one of the clubs and got approached by a local male and seemed innocent enough at first like just dancing talking chatting no big deal and then I don't even remember how the conversation got to this point but all of a sudden he's asking me if I want to go on his private jet to this other part of the island like and it's one of those things like it sounds like a prince sweeping you off your feet kind of story and it also sounds sketchy as all hell right (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) so just being smart and like holding your ground when you say no because they're gonna put on the charm at that point oh yeah um and it was a similar very different but similar kind of situation that one of my friends ended up in um at a very different time i was not with her but i did hear about it afterwards and i mean she ended up hospitalized so oh my god things do happen and it's just a matter of being smart, like don't go off with the random person by yourself, like have contingency plans, make sure like that's where it's doing your due diligence. Like don't hold back out of fear of if something feels good, but it's really, it's being able to listen to your intuition well enough. If you haven't built up that skill, that's okay. Just maybe be a little bit more pragmatic about it then. Um, 
have, I'm not necessarily like saying have a weapon on you by any means, but no. have, have some way to protect yourself and someone who knows exactly where you're going. So I will say in Poland, there was one instance where I did go off with someone that I had just met, but I made sure three people who knew me knew exactly where I was at the time. Again, this was 2008. Like we had the brick Nokia phones, like no one could track oh, yeah, me yeah. Yes, at this point. Um, but they knew exactly where I was. They knew exactly what time I was going to be back and how to get police to me if they didn't hear from me in a certain amount of time. So just having those little contingency plans, because if that had gone south, I would have been able to at least, like, I don't even know what would have happened for that right. to have right. not like worked out okay in the end. Right. Yeah, great advice. So are there favorite places that you have to go that you've been solo backpacking or traveling that you would recommend? Vietnam. Oh, wow. I mean, I've, I've got a whole list, but Vietnam is hands down my favorite. Um, and it kind of depends on what you want to go for. So I like Vietnam because it's not quite as touristy. Most people choose to go to Thailand instead. Yeah. Um, Laos is on my list to go to. I've heard it's amazing. I haven't been yet. But kind of the same thing. The culture is amazing. The people are so friendly. The food is incredibly fresh and delicious. Like I was joking with, I randomly, a sorority sister was also traveling to Vietnam at the same time. So we did meet up for one day because we had, we were in different cities and we were joking about the fact that we felt like we could eat, eat our weight in food. It would only cost us like $10 <laughs> a day. And we were actually losing weight and we didn't really know how. <laughs> um, and I honestly think part of it is because there's, the food is so fresh and there's zero preservatives. So, and again, the people are so nice. The culture is so rich. It's stunning over there. Um, the same kind of factors, honestly, for why Croatia would also be the top of my list and uh, Colombia. Wow. I love these recommendations because they, <laughs> they are, they're just completely, you know. Yeah, it's not like, now granted, don't get me wrong. I love Cinque Terre in Italy. Like there are more traditional places that I really like. Um, I don't know about Cinque Terre now. I hear it's still gorgeous, but I went in 2008 before it blew up on Instagram. Yeah. Um, so from what I've heard, it has gotten more popular. It's maybe not as bad as the Amalfi Coast, but, um, yeah. And then solo backpacking, if listeners are in like the continental U S I mean, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, uh, Banff, Canada is phenomenal. There's and when I say Banff, I don't even just mean Banff National Park. A lot of people stay in Banff and they don't go to Jasper or Yovo oh, wow. or was it Kootenay? There's like four yeah, or five there's national like... parks that are right there. And everyone just kind of stays in Banff. So like I say that, but like get get out into a different trail or a different area and kind of get away from the crowds. Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. That's great. Um, are there things that you would suggest for people that have, you know, if they're going backpacking alone and feel lonely, do you have tips for, you know, do, you know, the first time out, they may hit that wall where they're like, oh my gosh, I really am alone. And, you know, kind of. Yeah. So two things, one, start small. The first time I did a solo backpacking trip, it was one night in Olympic National Park. And I actually got there I got to the ranger station early and chatted with them about like, okay, where would you recommend if I'm just doing one night, I kind of want some solitude, but I also want to be safe about it. Um, I mean, those rangers often know the park inside and out, like yeah. utilize them. And then the other thing would be, if you feel like you might hit that point, then pick a route where you're going to meet other travelers. So I solo backpacked to Machu Picchu. Ooh, nice. And oh my gosh. Yeah, so you cannot do the Inca Trail solo. You have to go with a guide for the Inca Trail, but there's two other routes that allow you to do it solo. Um, and I did a lot of research between those two because I wanted more solitude, and there's one that would definitely give you that. There is one of them, one of the routes is a little bit more strenuous, and it is very secluded. And all the blogs that I read were like, either no Spanish, because if you run into trouble, yeah. The locals are not locals in that particular area are not going to speak English. And the only local you might run into is a llama. So like <laughs> have some first aid certifications, really know your shit and maybe also it'd be helpful to speak Spanish. Well, I don't speak Spanish. I do have the certifications, but I was like, okay. And then I also read the time of year that I was going. Um, if the glacier, like there might've been some spots that might be impassable still then versus like a month later. So I was like, okay. 
the other trail is popular enough that I knew I was going to run into people. In fact, I still talked to one of the girls that I ran into oh, and wow. met and ended up hiking with on the trail. Um, so that's one where I could have intentionally stayed more solo, or I had the option of talking to other travelers that were on the trail and kind of partnering with them for giant legs of it if right. I really wanted to. Right. Yeah. So if you do your research and a trail is like, you'll find, like, I found that very quickly in all of the reviews and the blogs where they were stating of like, Hey, it's not a secluded, it's safer. You can meet other travelers or like it, it said those things in the reviews. Um, and so my first day was completely solo. And then it actually, I'll admit the, see the six day trek. So four of those days I was hiking with two other people. Um, swapping stories and blasting music on these really I'm actually not the biggest fan of people blasting music on trails but there was one area where it was just the three of us no one else was around and we wanted to give up yeah. so we started <laughs> blasting music just as a way to motivate us up this right. absurd hill that we were doing oh my gosh those are actually great tips and great stories Megan oh those are mm. fabulous um so lastly because I know we're getting close to the end of our time to chat um are there Groups, I know you mentioned a few for people that are interested. I, I love the idea of solo travel. I think, as you mentioned, many times you're like, oh, I want to go this place. And then you ask around and nobody wants to go. And so I love the idea mm -hmm. of like, just start doing it on your own. Life is going to pass you by. And then exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and if it's the other, the other thing that I didn't even intentionally think about at the time, but why I think so when people ask me my one piece of advice for other yes. people, even though like I have this very strong medical background, I have a very strong athletic background. Um, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I'm a CrossFit coach. I'm also a burnout coach for clinicians. I've, I've written an empowerment journal. Like I have all these tools and yet my number one piece of advice is to solo travel. That, that is, is literally amazing. my number one piece of advice for anyone. And it's because it is the biggest driver of personal growth that I have ever found. And it's because, so say you do go on a trip with a friend, you're then going to be asking them, well, what do you want to do today? What, what do we want to do? Like you're going, your trip is going to be somewhat contingent on what the other person's needs are and what their other, what their wants are. Versus if you go on your own, you now have to answer the questions of what the heck do I want to do? How do I want to spend my time? Right. What do I enjoy? And these are questions that more often than not, I think we, when we're put in those situations, we realize we don't actually know the answers to, which is scary, but we need to know the answers to those things. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really beautiful thing to even intentionally, like, even if it's more of like, oh, well, I haven't traveled because no one wants to go with me. Like I, that can be a great catalyst, but do it on your own just because. Like at this point, I try to do a solo trip, even locally, um, at least once a month. Nice. Nothing crazy, but just maybe even at just a day where I have to go somewhere new and just think, what is it that I want to do today? And then go do it. I love that. I think that's fabulous. And I think like, you, I agree with all of that. Super amazing. So Megan, I like I, that might not have quite been the actual question that you asked. So what, what no. was it? <laughs> no, I think it was the actual question, but okay. I wanted you to share with people. I know you have a website. It's called oh, Move groups. on the Daily. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, so tell us. So you, yeah. Yeah. Sin Fem is a great one. If you are, if you identify as a female and want to get outdoors more, that one really is centered more around outdoor activities. And then as far as solo travel, there are a lot actually now that gets back into some privilege because there are tons of retreats and groups that are like groups that not necessarily solo travel, but there are a lot of groups that promote and are centered around, Hey, you don't have anyone else to travel with. Come join our group. And it's a bunch of solo travelers. So two things, one that doesn't really get the whole solo travel thing. Like it does get you out traveling, but it's not truly solo. Cause then you're, it's a great way to meet people. Like I, I do think there's a lot of value, but it's not the same. And those also tend to cost thousands of dollars because you have someone else facilitating it. Um, 
So outside of that, I honestly Google searches. There are a lot of travel blogs out there that give a lot of tips and give a lot of insight into wherever it is that you want to go. Um, Pinterest slash travel blogs or Pinterest will send you to the travel blogs. The other one, I'll just throw this out there because it's not part of my business yet, but it's something that I have thought about multiple, multiple times. So if there's anyone who's like, you know what? I would just love someone to create a very basic bare bones itinerary for me based on what I like to do and where I want to go. Shoot me a DM. Instagram is definitely where I'm the most active and it's move on the daily daily is spelled like my last name. Shoot me a DM. Let's work out something that's within your budget. If it's been, if it's somewhere that I've already been, I probably already have an itinerary. Like I know I have a, um, I did this for a friend actually a couple of years ago. She paid me for a two week Vietnam itinerary oh, nice. where, and I, I kind of, I based it loosely off of like what I did meets what she wanted to experience going south to north through the whole country. Wow. So again, like having this weird knack for being able to do things like that. I mean, it's something I enjoy. So it's not a big deal for me to make that incredibly affordable for someone and take some of my time to put that out. Yeah, I like that. So tell people again how they can reach you, Megan, because I think that's true. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people that want to solo travel. They see the benefits, and they just don't know where to begin. And they don't know where to start. Yeah. They're like I like food or I like fashion <laughs> or I like, you know, just being outside, but they just yeah. honestly, they don't know. And you have a wealth of information to share just to kind of, like you said, bare bones, like, you know, how much is your budget and here's some resources. Yep. So I love this. This is great. <laughs> yeah. So Instagram's easily the easiest way to get a hold of me and it's move on the daily D A L E Y spelled my like, like my last name. Generally, I find as soon as you start typing move on the and then start typing D, I, I've popped up at that point on the search bar. And um, so, yeah, shoot me a DM and I'll give two other resources that I really love. So Airbnb, even if you don't stay, you can search the experiences in the area and you don't necessarily need to book with them, but it'll tell you a lot of the experiences that you can then find. So I've utilized that before, as well as on Airbnb, I have found, so say... I did this when I traveled to Peru because as a solo traveler, I was like, okay, I have a tripod, but it takes a lot of finagling to get some photos. So I'll find a local photographer on Airbnb. It's generally a fraction of the price that you would pay elsewhere. And I'll do that on day one because then I get a local's recommendations for where to go for the rest of my trip. Excellent. Um, so I, I love that. And then next vacay.com. So it's these two um, Google software engineers that have figured out it's basically it's a flight finder so it automatically it i think it's 25 bucks a year and it will automatically email you anytime there's a really good flight deal in your area so you can put in your home airport it will also send you nearby airports like i live in phoenix it'll send me lax because sometimes it's easy enough for me to hop over to lax right. and then like I, I saw one come through the other day where it's like all right phoenix to Sweden, seven hundred dollars round trip, which is a crazy good deal for Sweden. Yeah, that is a crazy um, good deal. It's how I got to Vietnam, actually. Oh, is it? Was okay. an air um, an airline deal came through, and some of this requires knowing enough geography. So I saw a deal come through and said LAX to Kuala Lumpur, which is Malaysia, for four hundred dollars. Wow. And I looked and I was like, okay, I have points on Southwest at this time to hop over to LAX and back and do that leg of the trip. And then I searched for cheap airlines in Asia and realized I could fly, uh, go from Kuala Lumpur to Vietnam for 30 bucks on AirAsia. Oh my God. So <laughs> getting to Vietnam from the U S is generally over two grand. Oh, easy. And yeah. I got there for four fifty. Wow. Um, so that's, it's well worth the $25 to get that service. Um, but yeah, outside of that, say you find a flight on next vacay, grab it, shoot me a DM, ask me for an itinerary. Cause next vacay, I will say it's not generally, and I get no money for, I shout them out so much and I get zero kickback for it. Um, it's not generally immediate. Like the deals that I have come through now are like, Hey, January through February of next year. Like, but you do need to book it pretty quickly while that flight deal is available. Right. But, but that yeah. sometimes is the inspiration. If someone sees a deal Grab yeah, the, grab that the I already knew deal. I wanted to go to Vietnam yeah. for that one. But like the number of times I've been like, oh, maybe I do want to go to Vienna when I see yeah, a flight deal come through. Right. <laughs> I'm kind of like you too. I mean, 
airfare has gotten to be one of the most expensive components of traveling as a whole. So if you see a deal and you can't use it, it is till, yeah till January. Now you have plenty of time to research and figure out the rest of it. Yeah, and take it. And that's that's another great point to bring up is just budget. There's so many people that I hear saying, "I want to travel, but I don't have the money." Okay, for starters, switch that mindset to I want to travel and I don't have the money right now. Switch the butt to an and to open up your mind to possibilities. You don't have to go to like Turkey or Sweden or Switzerland or one of the, Switzerland's actually what I was thinking of, one of the places that's a lot really expensive yeah. to travel to. Like Iceland, really cheap to get to, very expensive once you're there. So, okay, maybe you go to Mexico or maybe you go to Guatemala, somewhere where it's relatively like it's reasonable to get there and it's going to be cheap once you get there like just switch around your idea of what that travel has to like it doesn't have oh, to yeah. look any one way exactly. but what's your purpose behind the travel right is it to be present is it to is it for personal development like what's the why behind your travel and then how can you fit that why within your budget yep I so agree, Megan. This has been fabulous. So I hope people reach out to you. And again, it was yeah. Move on the Daily, D-A-L-E-Y. Yep. So yes, ma'am. Reach out to Megan. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.